I'll call to order meeting of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers, February 22nd, 2024. If you write that out, it could be 22224. I, I liked that this morning. Yeah. Good date. Um, all managers are present except Manager Miller and Manager Loftus. And um, at this point in the meeting, should we hear from Ms. Schaffler? I think President White were to save that uh, that administrator's report. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, members of the public who wish to address the board, um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you, Manager Miller and Second Manager Maxwell. Those in favor say uh, aye. 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 And Maxwell. Agenda is approved. Did I say the wrong thing? You said Miller. Oh, thank you. The M got me confused there. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks to our operations staff for the uh, quarter four financial report that's in our packet. And moving next to the consent agenda, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda which contains approval of the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, the three check registers, and one resolution which is um, accepting the uh, tort liability limits on our uh, casualty insurance. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Manager Hedgemonti moves. Manager Second. Sandoz seconds. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's approved. <coughs> it's of course been four weeks since our last meeting, so I did have a few meetings I attended. Um, the liaisons have been at briefings for 325 Blake Road in Minneapolis, and the Hopkins liaison meeting at Hopkins City Hall with managers Maxwell and Hedgemonti and I and council members um, took place also in the at the end of the month. Um, I attended the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board 140th anniversary party at Mia. That was, um, and they had exhibits there about the history of the park and what they've done in the last years. That was really worthwhile going. Uh, and then the last thing I would mention is that I attended a Lost Lake related meeting mound uh, last week. Um, James had convened uh, the developer in the city and LMCD and DNR. Um, and I was there because the mayor of Mound was included and the state representative as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't ordinarily be at a meeting like that. Went very well. Are you, do you mean to say anything about it later? I can provide a few more uh, okay. reports for <coughs> some of the next steps because we're meeting with the developer of the city next week. Okay, great. Um, Manager Maxwell, Policy and Planning Committee meeting report. We had, uh, we had two meetings on this today. One was the uh, policy rules committee, like a rules and update of the rules, and the other one was a strategic action plan for the for, uh, next five years, four years. And they're both good. Jane, Becky and James did a both great job on them. And maybe I could also take a, just a minute and say I was at two Hopkins City Council meetings. After that, the one was uh, Gabe and, and Mike did a great job of making, doing a presentation on the watershed districts. Uh, section of the 325 Blake. In the following week, they had another city council meeting that I attended. That was uh, the approval of the funding for the for the project and the, all the designs as ever. Maybe uh, building C, I think it was. So it was two good meetings that making 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 progress. Gabe and Mike did a great job in the on the uh, just on our project completely. Just really good. I'm glad everything. you attended. I saw that <coughs> the. Uh, yeah. The virtual version then was really impressive. Yeah. So, so thank, thanks to them very much for their time and effort too. The um, upcoming meetings are noted in the agenda, including this CAC meeting in March, which Manager Olson will be liaison for. We'll go to item 11.1, .1, resolution 24012, Mr. Beck presenting. President White, uh, Board of Managers. Uh, Thank you. Good, uh, good evening. Uh, before you, I have a uh, request for action on selecting a consultant for developing the uh, watershed-wide 2D model to support climate planning. So uh, just before we jump <coughs> into the uh, discussion and, and the presentation, I just want to give a brief overview of what we'll be talking about. Uh, first, it's always useful to start at the beginning and provide the climate action framework context and how this fits into it. 
uh, give an overview of the past work and how uh, we've used learnings from previous projects to inform how we're moving forward. Uh, just an overview of the scope of work and how the past work has informed that. Uh, lastly, uh, the RFP process that we went through for um, uh, soliciting for vendors. In addition, next steps, and lastly, the recommendation. So this is a slide that you're likely getting used to, which is the Climate Action Framework, uh, one that uh, James had went through at the, at the committee meeting earlier, which is uh, the three pillars of our Climate Action Framework which include the understand and predict, convene and plan, and lastly, that implement, measure, and adapt. And what we'll be talking about primarily here, which uh, is the understand and predict, and a lot of, of that work is through this 2D model that we're gonna be building over the next year and a half. And so the timeline for that, this is the, the most um, kind of coarse timeline that we've developed, includes uh, model build, which is going to start very soon, um, um, based on the board's um, recommend or uh, decisions tonight, and we'll go through May of 2025. Uh, and then there is scenario analysis, which is separate a separate uh, project from the actual model build, which will start in 2025 and likely have some overlap with the model build to ensure that um, we're able to build the model or that we build the model to ensure that we're um, analyzing the right scenarios. However, the understand and predict is really only that pillar one um, that is being um, uh, run in parallel to the convene and plan uh, portion of the climate action framework, which is being led by policy planning. And uh, I think the reason why I wanted to highlight the importance of, of why uh, these items are happening in parallel is a lot of the model build and the scenario analysis are going to be informed by uh, the feedback that we get during a lot of the engagement work that's going to happen in 2024 and 2025. And ultimately, our goal is to uh, incorporate all of this work into the 2027 comp plan. And that's why it's really important that we continue to try and uh, hit our deadlines for building the model uh, so that we can ensure that we can get those scenarios analyzed and get that information into the, the comp plan so that in 2027, ideally, we deliver that and moving forward, you can be, we can be implementing the projects and policies developed in, in there. So uh, that's the, the long-term plan, but if we're talking about the model that we're going to build, we want to build uh, a watershed model that's able to un help us understand how water moves through the system. And so to do that, you want to take the, the items on the left, which are the geographic uh, representations of either soils, um, groundwater and all the different thing, the different geographic types that describe our, our watershed and combine those into a digital representation of our watershed. So we can run scenarios and understand not only how climate change is going to impact our system, but then also identify areas where we can um, help our system adapt to uh, uh, the, the extreme weather events that we're going to have in the future and have experienced already. And so if we're building a model, uh, I like to summarize any, any watershed model into two simple steps, which is there's a phase one, which is obtain all of those data sets that you're going to represent in your model. Take those, process them into a format that can go into a model and ideally fill any critical gaps. There's a phase two, which is putting that information into the model as that digital representation of your watershed. So typically, with a bunch of small st steps in between, that's the, the highest level way you build any you know, watershed model. And as we were going through this and, and working through the Climate Action Framework development, um, in 2020, 2021, and 2022, uh, we were applying for LCCMAR funding. And so we had two unsuccessful runs in 2020 and 2021. And during that time, we wanted to ensure that we kept moving forward um, the, the project to ensure that we were able to meet the 2027 um, deadline for, or, or goal for having a lot of this work done and uh, information incorporated into the comp plan. And so to do that, we took the idea of these two phases and built out um, a pilot model. And so from that, what we wanted to do was number one, 
establish an automated data processing framework, or at least semi-automated processing data framework, and fill uh, data gaps that we found along the way. Um, because we knew that when we built out the entire watershed model, when we you know, ultimately received funding, uh, that we could have as much of that data uh, uh, processed as possible. Then we also wanted to go through a process of understanding which model would best suit our needs for implementing um, the climate action framework. And so we went through a process of winnowing from eight models to two models, and then ultimately the pilot model helped us understand which, which, which software packages really would best suit our needs. That worked, primer, uh, that worked finished up in mid-2023, uh, where we took that information, put it, uh, assembled it in a report with Kimberly Horn, where that uh, was used as the foundation for a lot of the work that we're going to be doing moving forward. When you scale up to watershed-wide, uh, we wanted to, as again, we wanted to continue to work, move the work forward, um, even though we only received funding in July 2023. Uh, so leading up to that, we obt uh, obtained many of the watershed-wide data sets and used that automated processing system to put them into a single format. So a lot of that work um, is finishing up, in the process of finishing up and should be done in uh, mid to late March, so next month. And that really leads us to the model build. Um, so we went through a lot over the past few years to try and essentially do our due diligence and ensure that we knew why we were picking the model and how we would build that model. But along the way, we had a lot of learnings and, and stumbles along the way, which ideally are good to have in a pilot system instead of your water, watershed-wide system. And so one of the first learnings that we had is that as we're, as we're developing a model that's really going to impact uh, our, our entire organization's direction moving forward, we want to have staff understand the model as much as the consultant. And the reason why this is the case is understanding how to facilitate scenario analysis, ensuring that we can answer the right questions and that uh, you know, nothing's happening kind of in a vacuum in the dark without staff really being able to stress test the decisions being made is really important. And we know how important it is um, based on past project experience as well. And so to do that, we racked our brains. And so we said, OK, the consultant will be building the lower watershed model. Uh, as you know, this is the more urbanized portion of our, so our, of our watershed um, and has really, really complicated uh, stormwater networks. We, we thought MCWSB staff could build the upper watershed model because the, it's, it's um, less developed, has uh, less complicated stormwater networks, which means it's going to be a, a, an easier watershed model to build, but it still helps you understand how the watershed model is built and allows us to really dig in and understand the process to, to building out the model. Another learning was um, during a model build, having a, the consultant and MCWD have an agreed upon uh, approach for building the model. So during any model or watershed build, uh, watershed model build, there's a lot of small decisions that occur along the way, and they can have really large impacts to how the model functions. And so understanding how, you know, having a really good understanding of how you're going to build the model prior to building the model um, is important because you don't want to have to go back and rebuild portions of it if we have a third-party reviewer, um, you know, express concerns over a certain uh, way the model is developed. And lastly, one of the big um, learnings that we had were, was that uh, as we processed a lot of the municipal stormwater networks, we were really hoping there would be a lot of uh, pond or wetland volume data, so how big and how deep the wetlands are in, in those data sets. But really, there was very little um, available either through municipal uh, stormwater data sets and also not much for uh, volume in statewide or regional data sets. So that's just a, a data set that's, that's largely not available or easily available that we know of. And so how did we um, address those two issues? This was our original scope that we were gonna put into the RFP, which follows uh, the two-step or the two-phase process, which is essentially a data processing portion 
portion. However, we added in two tasks, which include uh, a discrete task of developing the modeling approach before you start doing the model build. And so that, that process is uh, four workshops with MCWD staff and the consultant to go through a series of critical decisions that we'll agree on prior to and document. So we both can build, both models are built consistently between the upper and water, lower watershed. And then secondly, building out a storage, that, that pond and wetland storage data set and incorporating it into the um, standardized data set that we've already developed. So that's, that's how we thought we could address some of the, the, the issues and, and learnings that we had during the, during the um, earlier phases of the project. So we took that information and that scope and released an RFP uh, on January 2nd. Uh, the, the budget range for that was 580 to $620,000. Uh, and after that, had an informational interview, uh, closed the RFP on January 24th. Uh, we received three proposals from Stantec, HDR, and Kimley Horn. Uh, and one thing that was really nice as we received the proposals, there was only about a $11,000 difference between the highest and lowest proposals. So that suggested that there was relatively clear understanding of uh, what needed to be done and, uh, and the level of effort for each task. Uh, we interviewed all three firms and uh, we used the selection criteria of project understanding. So how well does the consultant understand the project, uh, the method, their methods and approach, the project team experience, and budget. Um, however, the budget, since they were so close on a, on a very large project, uh, didn't end up being a really critical um, uh, factor weighing in. And from those uh, criteria, uh, staff is recommending um, going with HDR to support MCW's build of the 2D watershed model. And the reason behind that was, number one, uh, HDR developed or, or had a really clear understanding of, of the model build context. And when I say that, we're not just building a model to build a model. We have it in context of our climate action framework. And so uh, they articulated really nicely of the importance of the decision making along the way um, uh, and how that is going to impact uh, our climate action framework. They outlined a really clear method for collaboration. Um, and I think this is one of the things that really set their proposal apart was uh, a really clear way to um, facilitate that task two, which was the model build approach, and the steps that we'd go through to get on the same page on how we would build the model and do it collaboratively um, and not in, and as a buzzword, but a, a, a process that they could step us through. Uh, they have a very experienced project manager uh, on the team who attended the meeting today, who we've worked with on the 325 Blake uh, Road project, which, as we all know, is one of the more complex projects that we've worked on. So uh, have experience with that, in addition to the modeling team having a lot of experience with uh, the model that we selected um, at a watershed-wide scale. And lastly, uh, they proposed a really linear process to build a uh, watershed model, uh, which is really great of not sh making decisions already about how the model's going to be built, but a process that we'll step through to build the model together. And so for those reasons, we selected HDR um, and, and we're really impressed by, by their proposal. So before we get to the recommendation, I just want to give a few brief next steps uh, to let uh, the board know what you'll see in the near future. Uh, first of all, that phase one of the watershed-wide build, which was standardizing the data sets prior to getting into the build, uh, that will close out in ideally mid to late <coughs> March, uh, so next month. Uh, we'll be, pending um, the board's decision today, uh, moving forward with contract execution with, with uh, HDR in early March. Uh, staff will be taking a training on um, uh, ICPR4 uh, in, in mid-March so that we can hit the ground running uh, for, for the model build. And lastly, we're, uh, we're in the middle of receiving scopes from two organizations. So uh, firstly, the developer of the model, uh, the, the software developer of the model, 
So they can act as third party review for any models built and, and they'll be incorporated throughout the, the project to ensure that the model's being built um, to, and, and approved along the way. And we're, uh, we're in dialogues with a, a academic who at, at Virginia Tech who does climate modeling using ICPR4, which is the model that we're using for this project. And so he uh, was a really critical advisor through the pilot model and gave really great feedback uh, to us. So we thought he'd be a, a really great advisor along the way for this project as well. So we'll be bringing that back in, in March as well. So with that, um, staff is requesting um, uh, uh, recommends approval of uh, item 24-012, uh, which is awarding the contract to build a 2D model to support climate adapt adaptation planning for, uh, for the Climate Action Framework with HDR. So with that, uh, take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Is there a motion to um, adopt the resolution? Manager Hijmati, is there a second? Second. Manager Olson, are there questions for Mr. Beck? Manager Olson. Oh, I have a few. Um, uh, on the fourth, whereas in your resolution, I'm confused. It says Bolt and Mink. So oh, okay. That's just a typo. Okay, it yeah. should say Kimley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the one I was going to play Okay. Yeah. All right. And then the second thing is um, who owns the model? Uh, will HDR be able to go out and present their work at a public forum and say, look at this great um, tool? Or is that something we have copyright on? How, how is that? Than determined. Yeah, um, President White Man Manager Olson. Uh, we, <laughs> this is a, a topic of discussion as we submitted for LCCMR uh, funding. Uh, we ensured that the district would retain ownership of the model, um, and we had to write that into the, the grant agreement. So that was something that took quite a bit of time and, and a little bit of a delay in that process uh, since they typically. Um, don't allow the, the applicant to retain authority of anything that they create. They want it to be owned by state. Uh, <laughs> however, we said that we won't be profiting from this, it, but we will retain authority uh, and, and ownership of the model. Do you anticipate us being willing to share it with any, anybody else? We do uh, um, have sh uh, model sharing agreements, I believe, for the XP Swim model, and I think that that's something that we'd like to develop okay. this as well. Uh, the other question is uh, regarding our consultant from out east. Uh, do you anticipate compensation for him? Yes, we likely will have some level of financial compensation for him. Um, do you do like we go to get a quote from him, or how do you? Yeah, so we'll be getting a quote from him okay. as well. So yeah. So we should expect to see that mm -hmm. coming up then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And here's my yeah, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, as a liaison, I'd like to report back to go ahead. to the board. Um, and um, you know, Dick, as you know, Dick has not been able to participate. So I've I've caught, I've spoken with him on the phone and kept him up to date on everything. So what I'm going to, and I told him what I was going to say, so when I'm saying this, it's both of us speaking. Okay, I'm speaking on his behalf as well. Okay. Um, and really our perspective as board liaisons was to, um, to, 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 you know, maintain oversight and also give input from a policy perspective. <clears throat> and that's what we both attempted to do during this whole process. And, you know, one of the top things that we've seen, but, and Dick and I both agree on this, is that is the very high quality of professional work that our folks do. You know, they really, really do excellent professional, high quality work. Uh, that culture of excellence really shows up, uh, showed up when they were, you know, as we went through this and they were through the interviews and so on. Um, I, I read all three proposals and I sat, I watched all three interviews. I did not participate in the interviews, but I watched the recording of them, and so I was able to get a sense of what was happening. And 
we basically concur with, um, you know, we had independently come to the same conclusion when we finally met that HDR was the one that seemed to really know what they were doing. And I will share with you some of the things that I saw that were really critical that, that I saw from our board perspective that HDR was really good. Um, uh, the fact that they have a really good um, project manager, you know, the guy who's managed the same, uh, what's his name? Andrew Judd. Andrew Judd, thank you. Andrew Judd, who's managed the um, 325 Blake Road, which is a very complex project, and he's done a really, um, he's, he's done a job so effortlessly and beautifully that it has not involved uh, that has really worked very cooperatively with our with our with our folks, and one of the things that I had been concerned about was if we have uh, if we have a, 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 a project manager who's not good at what he does, there's a hidden FTE cost to us because our folks don't have to spend that much time and you know managing the project instead of doing the things that they need to do. And so really having a good project manager is really vital for us to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So that is one of the things that, that we saw. A second thing that I saw was that they have experience in working uh, on large watersheds. They worked on a watershed in Louisiana, which is about one-fifth of the size of the state of Louisiana. It's huge. And they did, then they developed a process for doing that. They've also done it in Florida. And so the process that, that Brian was talking about, you know, the four meetings and so on, evolved from that. That is, they've been there, they've done it, they know what it takes to build it and how to work with, you know, with the agencies with, to make it happen. And so they really had the experience and know how to put it together and how to execute. And so that, I thought, was really critical. When I, you know, when I listened to them and read the, read the proposals. And that was what we concurred on when, you know, when, we, when we met uh, on this. Um, one of the interesting things they had was that when they are building the, when they are building the project, they have a separate team that is not involved in building the project who they consult with periodically who, who, who are essentially like a red team. They have an internal red team process to make sure that they don't mess up. And it's really important, like, like Brian said, it's very easy to make assumptions that, that get amplified in the process and make big mistakes. And so to catch those early, and so they, they're red teaming themselves. And so I was very impressed with the fact that they had incorporated that into their own process. And now we've got two other ways of red teaming, which is the ICP R4 and also the academic, who's two people who are going to independently look at it as well. And that's going to be really critical because it's, you know, it's easy to make mistakes on something as complex as this. It's a really, really complex project. Um, you know, it's not just building a model for a site, you know, like for Victoria or for Edina. It's patching those together into a whole that's very complex and very difficult. So the effect of one, what will the person doing in St. Louis Park affect Minneapolis? You know, being able to to do that, that kind of stuff, it's very complex. And so having that kind of oversight is really important. And so having a project manager who's done this before and knows how to handle it is uh, really, really critical. Um, one of the things that, that I really liked with what, what I'm seeing our staff do is that, that we are establishing that that Becky and her crew are establishing a relationship with the cities. Uh, and in, in this process, right from the start, doing the model build so that we can, so that they feel included in what's happening. And they, they can own it too, you know, as, as, as we go forward. 
And that's going to be really important as we move forward when we do the scenario analysis and you know, probably propose projects that we can work on together in the land water partnership. And so, again, I saw that as really critical in terms of from, from policy perspective into the future. So that was something I saw, thought that was really important. Uh, I'm seeing this as, um, you know, both Dick and I see this um, <coughs> As, as it's going to be a landmark piece of work, you know, when it's finished, uh, it's going to be something that not only is not only are our community is going to be using this, but I can see people looking at our shoulders, like Hennepin County and USGS, and seeing what we've done, and you know, you know, like we did for the carp, where we pioneered stuff, we're pioneering <coughs> stuff here. So. This, there's something really important about that. So, based on that, based on what, what I've said, HDR seems to be the one that we really need to go with. They have all of the stuff that I talked about. The others were good, but these people have experience. They've done it. They've been there, done that. On a huge, on huge, huge watershed project. And that's vital for something else. <coughs> like and a good, Andrew Jett is a very good project manager, so so we are, you know, when we met, and we, uh, was a week ago when we met, we were really aligned, um, Dick and I were really aligned with, with, the, with the team, so I wanted to share that. Thank you for your, your input. Hmm. Any questions for Mr. Beck? All right, then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Mr. Wolf has um, resolution 24013. Oh, should have brought my sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of enjoying the. I, I, <laughs> we were in a mood. <laughs> <laughs> just make Sorry, sure you know. Yeah. Well, you're, what Josh is setting up, Brian, I think that small decisions have big, um, out, can have big outcomes. Maybe it describes all of life. You know? <laughs> Ready? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, good evening, President White, Board of Managers. As I mentioned in the, the meeting earlier today, I'm very excited to bring this project to you this evening. This is uh, the approval of the 90% design plans for Cottageville Park Maintenance and Retrofit Project. So first we'll do a little bit of background, then talk about the system function, review the design, and discuss the disturbance and restoration terms, and then I'll go over timeline and some next steps. So Cottageville Park is located along Blake Road in the city of Hopkins. This project is part of the larger Greenway system of district projects. This map frames the project as part of that system which includes the 325 Blake Road development, the Japs Olson site, the Minnehaha Creek Preserve, and the Methodist Hospital Creek Remeander. For some project background, in 2010, the city of Hopkins and MCWD executed a cooperative agreement to expand and develop Cottageville Park in a struggling area of the city. The goals were to approve and integrate community park amenities within the riparian system, increase public recreation and education, naturalize and stabilize the creek channel, and provide regional stormwater treatment. Here we see the stark comparison of before and after photos highlighting the way in which the Cottageville Park site has changed. In 2010, the area was a high priority for redevelopment. The district purchased the parcels adjacent to the creek and partnered with the city to create the park. Revitalizing an area that had been subject to the highest concentration of 911 calls in the city of Hopkins. Construction of the park was completed in 2016 and transformed the former struggling area into a thriving center of community. Emergency calls to the area have been significantly reduced and the park now features a pavilion space, playground, public access to the creek, and a community garden. Not all of the project is visible, however. Located below the circular great lawn seen here in the bottom left of the screen, this project also included construction of an underground stormwater storage and filtration system. Construction of the system was completed in 2016 and is comprised of a 60-inch HDPE header pipe 
and 12 48 inch inflow storage pipes. The header pipe is filled to 50% volume with an iron sand filter medium. Stormwater enters into the system at the top right, the northwest corner, from a 22 acre drainage area of the Blake Road storm sewer system. Additional water flows from park area drains to the northeast and southeast. Water is then distributed between the smaller inflow pipes before draining into the header pipe and flowing through the filter medium, removing contaminants such as phosphorus before discharging into the creek at the bottom left, the southeast corner of the system. So why bring this project to the board this evening? The district owns the land in fee and the city has easements over the property. Through the cooperative agreement, the district is responsible for maintaining the native vegetation, repairing buffer zones and the educational signage throughout the park. The city of Hopkins then maintains the park property, including mowing of the Great Lawn, and is responsible for all maintenance of the stormwater facility. As we discussed, the system is underground and cannot be inspected visually. This fact, coupled with the innovative technology utilized by the system, led the District Research and Monitoring Program to begin monitoring the system in 2017. This monitoring revealed high phosphorus concentrations at the outlet of the system. Additional monitoring over the next several years, which included televising the system, seen in the bottom left of the screen, determined that the system was not performing to its intended function. Staff hypothesized that the filter media was being scoured and bypassed by the incoming stormwater, requiring maintenance of the system. Additionally, the filter medium in the header pipe has reached the end of its usable life cycle and is due for routine replacement. A challenge point to this project is the lack of access to the interior of the system. Due to changes in the initial design instructed by city employees during construction, no access manholes were installed. In 2023, MCWD staff worked with the city to design a retrofit to the system which will address these issues. The current project will replace the iron sand filter medium as part of its life cycle maintenance, add rate control measures to the system to reduce scouring of the filter medium, and install four access risers, allowing for future maintenance and access to the filter medium. This project has been incorporated into a larger City of Hopkins capital improvement project, the 2024 Central Avenues Improvements. 100% of the $72,000 project will be covered by the City of Hopkins. The recorded easement requires MCWD and the City of Hopkins to agree to a set of terms for occupation of the site in the event of construction exceeding routine maintenance such as this. The disturbance and restoration terms have been reviewed by district staff and legal counsel and the City of Hopkins. These terms allow for the occupation of MCWD lands, require coordination of MCWD attendance at the pre-construction and other pertinent project meetings, establish the limits of disturbance and access routes for the project seen here on the right. The terms require protection of the existing infrastructure on the property and require the district to be notified in advance of critical, critical construction waypoints in order to be available for observation. The board moves to approve the resolution this evening. The next steps will be signature of the disturbance res restoration letter by the district administrator, at which point the letter will be submitted to the city of Hopkins for a counter signature by the city manager. On February 9th, bids for the project were open. And on March 19th, the Hopkins City Council will award the bids. Tentative date for the beginning of construction is May 1st, with a final restoration of the site to be completed by November 1st. And with that, uh, we, I would request approval of 90% design plans and authorize the district administrator to approve additional design changes consistent with 90% plans as needed to complete 100% design documents and approve the draft letter and disturbance restoration terms for signature of the administrator and counter signature by the city of Hopkins. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? <coughs> Manager Sandor moves. Is there a second? Second. Manager Hishmati seconds. Questions for Mr. Wolf? Will the park be closed through the whole time, or just the center, just the circle? Um, that's not something that we have discussed. The, the center will almost certainly have to be closed, but as far as other closures of the park, um, that's something that we'll have to discuss with the, the contractor and with the city. I'm not, I'm not certain at this time. Um, the access, so the, the construction access route will be, will be coming through um, this main sidewalk here that you see um, in the center of the screen. Um, the reason for that, that it was designed as an access route, the concrete there is um, more robust than in other parts of the park. Um, so that was kind of built in to the park design. And there is, there's not a sprinkler system in the center, the grass area, is there? Um, I 
do believe that that is irrigated. And, um, I would ask if that is irrigated. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. God was saying I was going to take the water that was coming out that we clean to use it as the sprinkler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Who was who did the city um, contract with? Um, I I'm not sure. <coughs> Any other questions before we vote, Manager Olson? That photograph you showed of the pipe looked like it had completely emptied itself of the medium. Is that the medium? So that photo is actually of the construction of the pipe. And so oh, okay. um, uh, if you... I was going to say scoured. It looks like it's been yep. cleaned up. Nope. So if you look well, so if you look there, well, this... So are you talking about um, the, the bottom yeah. photo? So that's at the that's the very beginning of the television. Okay. So that's... Yeah, that's it. If you would go farther into the video, which is about thirteen minutes long, you would see that the the medium is is definitely still in there. Still in there. Um, and then if you're looking at the top photo, that's actually from the construction, and that is a conveyor belt system that's bringing, um, that's bringing the medium into the pipe at the time. So that's why there's none visible as well. It's the beginning of the construction. Oh, out of time at the bottom one yeah. the camera. One other one. And Chris, I, I assume you looked at this project many times. Too many. <laughs> I mean, your thumbs no, up is everything's good. Yeah. There's no. All right, and they're uh, working good with the city on that part, so the city engineer. All right, thank you. Are you going to be looking at the bids and things too, Cecilia? <coughs> yeah, it sounds like they're coming. So they already the accepted them, so. Oh, they've already accepted the bid? Yeah, they're, they're going to authorize it the March 19th, I think it was, but it sounds to me like they already accepted the bids. It'll just be a finalization of the vote. Oh, okay. Correct. And this is all the city's cost. Yeah, one hundred. Okay. Yes, President White. The one hundred percent of the cost will be taken on by the city. Okay. And what is it about seventy-two? Did you say? Uh, President White, Manager Hermati. Yes, it's seventy-two, 72 but just over seventy-two thousand dollars. Okay. Right. Anything else? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Are there any inquiries, issues, or ideas board members <coughs> to add to our list? Seeing none, we'll call on Mr. Whitaker for the administrator's report. Thank you, President White. Managers, um, for this evening's admin report, I've foregone um, a PowerPoint presentation based on my <laughs> performance during committee. Just can I give you, uh, Thank you. Too many flashing cards. <laughs> <laughs> Or something I'll, you just can't pass up. No, I'll take that in good. <laughs> I'll take that in good humor and positive critique. So, um, President White mentioned that we had met um, with the City of Mound, their Mayor, Monarch Development, um, the Department of Natural Resources, the Lake Minnetonka Conservation District, including appointed officials, one of their board members from there, and then State Representative Myers, who is actually a former um, Mound City Council member, I believe to look at a proposal for 18 townhomes on the west side of Lost Lake, um, the city of Minnetonka, which is a large historic wetland. And a core component of the developer's proposal and the city's vision is to dock out across this wetland and dredge a channel through the public water wetland for about 18 boat slips. So there was a tremendous amount of uh, prep and then dialogue um, in the meeting around the history of the area. Um, I do have some good slides, but like I just like I just said, I'm, I'm just too, <coughs> I'm just too sketched out. The um, the area was dredged originally for boat traffic in 1906 for steamboat um, navigation as part of the resort economy on Lake Minnetonka, and then that was abandoned kind of mid 20s as the economy around <coughs> the resort traffic on Lake Minnetonka started to shift. So it's a really interesting history around how this wetland was originally opened up to become um, connected to Lake Minnetonka. Um, and then really it was left in that condition from the 20s until the mid 90s with this long channel through the wetland and a, and a little circle towards the top near downtown Mount. And then in the 90s, um, the city of Mound established this vision that they called the Mound Harbor Renaissance. And they proposed to dredge the channel and to also remove historic fill of the lake. Um, over the years, fill was actually placed inside this um, area of open water to build a post office, of all things. And so they dredged the, proposed to dredge the channel and remove the post office and the fill and build a new harbor 
that would activate the downtown space and be a source or a driver of community development and redevelopment and revitalization of the downtown. Um, it was a really bold proposal at the time in the 90s. It took years and years of analysis and permitting and involved the Corps of Engineers, the DNR, the LMCD, us, the Pollution Control Agency around concerns around contamination of sediments and disposals as there's a nearby, a, a nearby dump that also got cleaned up. It required an environmental assessment. Um, and in all of those documents, there was an established dialogue and discussion on the record um, talking about concerns with the potential for future dredging, that if we do this project to dredge the channel and open up the harbor now, isn't that going to set the footprint for dredging in the future? And there was a lot of discussion around placing conditions on future dredging and those sorts of things. Anyway, all that history becomes relevant with the contemporary proposal. And so in the meeting that we had, um, there was a discussion around the, the record. And then given just the current Minnesota state regulations around dredging and by extension, our, uh, the watershed district regulations for dredging, um, the DNR, the LMCD, and the district in the meeting, I think, discussed just it's, it's a very high bar, if not impossible bar, to clear. Just a, a lot of challenges associated with opening up um, more of the wetland to new navigational access um, based on how dredging rules are applied, considering the um, impact to the natural resources balanced against uh, riparian rights of, of landowners. So. Um, an interesting outcome of the meeting, the developer showed some lateral thinking and, and started to t um, open up a discussion towards the end of the meeting, which has formulated some next steps around how uh, they might work with the city to optimize docking in the current open surface water area. Um, basically, I think the, the analogy that he used, which I think is an appropriate one, is um, he's worked on parking studies before. And this, the open water area is essentially a parking lot for boats. They, you know, so they're going to pursue, I think, a study to figure out can they integrate their 18 uh, boat slip units into the existing open water footprint without pursuing dredging, which would be a precursor step anyway to even asking for dredging because it would constitute a minimal impact solution. So that's one of the key next steps um, on that. And I think one of the reasons we wanted to report back on it and go into a little bit more detail, as President White mentioned, there's just... It's a big convening um, that we had a state representative that the city's really invested in terms of vision basis to see the developer acquire these properties and make use of them. And there's some real key policy decisions and potential natural resource impacts are at play that um, need to get weighed in on by everybody from the LMCD to us, to the Corps of Engineers, to the DNR. So and we took the lead and got everybody together. I think um, the general tone after the meeting was, wow, I haven't been to a meeting this large to talk about a project like this since before the pandemic. A lot of um, kind of old connections were rekindled and uh, we've maintained good open communication with the developers since then. They seem to really appreciate us putting everybody in one room so we could all discuss um, the challenges and get questions answered in front of everybody all in one place rather than having them play telephone for six months between the agencies. So I'm connecting with the developer again tomorrow. Uh, we'll be having a meeting next week I think on Thursday at City Hall with their civil site group and um, the, the city planners to talk about the upland component of the development. They have some spatial constraints with wetland buffers, shoreline setbacks, and stormwater. And so we're going to be meeting to discuss that while they pursue some of this um, dock optimization planning. So a little bit of a deep dive for you there. Um, and happy to take any questions as I catch my breath and move on to the next thing. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, I think at the last um, board meeting, I had reported out on the boardwalk, the Minnehaha Creek Preserve Boardwalk. We do continue to make what I think is real progress, um, simply in, in terms of opening up communication and putting one foot in front of the other with both the city and um, the contractor, JTS, um, whose principal is Jeff Smith. So um, since the last meeting, one of the things that I had put um, a, a marker out on the table for with the board is I had hoped to meet with him individually. We haven't really had open communication since, I want to say, late summer of 2023 um, when Mr. Smith uh, retained the services of an attorney. Um, we were able to speak with his attorney and then speak with Jeff and then set up a meeting where he and I met um, 
think about a week and a half ago now here in the office. We had a big two-hour meeting, and I got to hear from um, his perspective on how he got to the point that we're at now, a boardwalk with this number of deficiencies. Um, I listened to his concerns related to liquidated damages, which are just a factor of the contract that he signed, um, that following the um, substantial completion date or the contract completion date, um, he's accruing $100 uh, a day in liquidated damages plus engineering fees, and he's concerned about that. Um, but he's also expressed um, an explicit commitment to fixing the project in the discussion we had, which we formalized in writing and followed up with him and his attorney and the whole team. He said to me, short of uh, bringing in all new lumber, taking this thing down to the helicals and rebuilding it, he wants to make this right and fix it. Um, he's concerned about having to do that and incurring all the liquidated <coughs> damages. And I said, you know, those are sort of the, the facts of life, and we need to focus on next steps. Um, and what we've agreed to is that the next steps need to involve finalizing the engineering on the last outstanding uh, defective work category. And these, without getting too technical, um, each joist has a hanger, and for some of the hangers, they're on a skew because the boardwalk's not completely linear. And where there are skewed hangers and a gap between the joist and the header, we need his final engineering on that. So he has worked, working with his engineer to give us shop drawings and calculations for that and agreed on the direction for fixing it. Um, the next step would be then to meet, after that work comes in next week, we want to meet with him and his attorney and the whole engineering group to review the total engineering package and make sure the submittal package that would go to the city is tight and that we um, review a testing plan that we think the city wants to see. And then we would submit that. So those are the next two steps. And we did meet with both Jeff, um, the contractor, and his engineer um, and, and manufacturer this week. And we had an open dialogue. And they're pursuing the next steps that we've outlined. And we expect the materials to come in next week. Um, again, that's kind of the first meeting of that type in months. So just the fact that we're putting the people in the room and we're talking about the next steps and doing them seems like real progress. Um, we also. Um, have opened up lines of communication with the city, which I've reported on previously, just open dialogue with the building official and the interim building official. Um, but I was pleased that I got a call from the building and energy director, which oversees the building officials at St. Louis Park um, in the last couple of weeks since their last meeting, um, just continuing to open up communication lines at that leadership level. And it was some comfort to me that after our conversation, he really understands where we are the next steps that we're taking with the contractor and the timeline and supports those next steps and is ready to receive the submittal package and has encouraged us that once we have the full package submitted, he wants to sit down face to face and talk it through before they start reviewing. So I think that those are all really positive steps, still way slower than we'd hope. Um, I wish we were further along. Generally speaking, without getting too specific, because there are some things out of our control, I would hope that we would have a submittal into the city of St. Louis Park sometime in the next three weeks. That might place us in striking distance of having a decision out from the city in April. So, you know, it's taken a long time, but that's where we stand. Um, I'm trying to keep the information flowing to the board. I don't know if you've got any specific questions just about rate of progress or concerns, guidance. Well, I guess my only comment would be, is, does Lewis sit in? He brings his lawyer. Does Lewis, do you sit on these meetings too? We're using Lewis. Mr. Holtman, and so Lewis is tracking quite closely, okay. and, and Lewis, you obviously speak to that, but we're working very, very closely with Chuck Holtman on every step of the way, and up until this most recent point, um, Chuck has been the conduit for communications with Jeff Smith, attorney to attorney. Okay. And they have cleared with you know, both of their clients that it would be okay for us to re-engage and have dialogue with Jeff. So Chuck opened up that line of communication for me. Uh, Mark Kemper, JTS's attorney, then reached out to talk to me about what do you want to talk to my client about, it framed what we wanted to talk about, and then Jeff opened up communication, and then we sat down and met. So everything's that's what's taking so long is yeah. we're following a pretty yeah. regimented right. process. But I'll Just see if sure Lewis has to weigh in. Well informed of what's going on too at the same time. All right, that one good. Yeah, I'd say we have uh, four and a half touch points a week with legal counsel, so it's like almost daily. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Just comments that, that uh, I congratulate you on your persistence in 
making sure that, <coughs> that we connect with Jeff Smith because it really seemed like that was that was a key to see what you know to see where he's at and where his what his will is and what his interest is and so on and so that is a key so I really want to congratulate you on doing that Thank yeah you. and there's challenges ahead but yes. we're making progress I think right. after we get this what I had communicated to, to JTS is you know all of his concerns are moot if uh, the city won't if the city doesn't accept the changes that he's proposing so let's not stay in limbo having these circular dialogues. Let's put our best foot forward um, collaboratively. He's got an obligation. He's committed to it. Put the submittal package into the city. Um, if they say yes, you know, then we can have a dialogue around his concerns on liquidated damages and economics and all, you know, the kind of the fiscal side of it. But it, there's no point in entertaining any of that right now because we don't have any answers from the city on if what he's proposing is even viable. So. Um, it's been good to get to ground on that and just put one foot in front of the other, but it's slow going. Wasn't it two months ago we were wasn't there talk about the building inspector or the, from single part leaving or going on a two week, two months vacation or something like that? Or we something? yeah, there's uh, David Scala is the chief building official for the city of St. Louis Park Manager Maxwell, and he is out on leave, and so. Um, that was part of the communication challenge is like, well, how is his authority being transferred? Because there's different sort of scale of project issues to the interim building official Grant Sala. And so I spent, I went over to City Hall, I met with Grant, we've had a lot of communication. He's run that up the flagpole. And so we do have, you know, I think we have options. Um, I think there's a general preference to wait till um, Mr. Scallop returns because he's got deep, deep experience in dealing with these sorts of issues, but so does the Director of Building and Energy. And so I, it's been communicated to me that there is a preference, but there's also option to be making decisions um, if we're ready before he returns. And well, so, we're comfortable with the guy that's took over for this Yeah, okay. I think right. so, yeah. We've, and that's been, that's been the work that we've done, is we, we had relationship with Mr. Scallop, but we've also sort of opened up communications with his um, colleague, Grant, and then their director, Brian Hoffman. So we have communication now across all three, and so we'll we'll just see if uh, where Mr. Scallop's at in his leave when we're ready to submit the application package. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, a quick update on a letter of support that's been requested from our friends over at Lake Town Township. Um, President Wyatt and Manager Olson might remember when we gave our sort of annual update to the Carver County Commission, we met with, uh, there was a Lake Town board member that attended and he met with us in the hallway and since then their clerk, he, he was talking to us about some sanitary replacements that Lake Town Township is going through, much of which lies outside of our district, <coughs> um, but some of which are inside the district and they have followed up and requested letter of support because they're chasing $11 million in bonding this session to replace a 1980 uh, sanitary system, community sanitary system, these mound systems that serve some of the rural homes that are out there, some of which currently drain to Pearson Lake, which is the headwaters of Six Mount um, and Halstead Bay. Um, we've looked into that and looked at the basis of their request. They've got a letters of support from a number of other municipal partners and uh, we've drafted something up that would be under my name and I think pending dialogue with Joel Carlson, our government relations person, we plan to provide them a letter. It seems like a, a, a decent request and would benefit the water quality in Pearson Lake, but since that's going to the legislature, uh, we wanted to just have a quick touch point with Joel and let the board know that we would be putting that out there. So I don't know if there's any concerns or if you want to see the letter before it goes out, but wanted to keep you all informed. All right, two other things. I was at the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board last night presenting the uh, partnership program that we've discussed. So we do have, as a reminder, a draft cooperative agreement. It is now making its way through the park board, through the city council, and will come to the board in uh, March, knock on wood. Um, the basis of the partnership agreement that Lewis has really helped us uh, steer is we've got three pilot projects on Minnehaha Creek that um, would treat about 500 acres of urban runoff from Minneapolis, get about 40% of the waste load allocation that the city is required to address draining to impaired Lake Hiawatha. So some really high impact projects. Um, 
those three projects per the agreement would be moved into feasibility in 2024 with a shared cost of approximately $150,000 split three ways between the three partners. So that's sort of the first piece of the agreement is project feasibility. The second is we framed out a process or a structure for longer range planning to boil down the complexity across the um, chain of lakes, breaking the chain of lakes into management units, much like we've done for Six Mile Creek, Halstead Bay, or Long Lake Creek, so on a lake by lake basis, understanding what the issues driver strategies are, and aligning uh, capital projects and investment across the three partners, maybe beginning with Cedar and Nokomis, because the park board's done some recent diagnostic work for those and they'd like to chase some grant dollars. So there's a long range planning component as piece number two in the agreement. And then the third piece is the governance or the partnership structure. So you might remember through some of the committee presentations, we've got a steering committee that we've proposed that would be um, comprised of three policymakers from each organization, three council members, plus the mayor's office, um, three park board members, and three watershed board members as a steering committee. And below that, staff leadership, and below that, technical staff. That would meet periodically, the steering committee twice a year, to review the next wave of proposed in investments. So we're excited about that. We presented at the park board last night at their administration and finance committee, sort of a committee of the whole. Everybody was there, much like our committees. We got a really warm reception. Um, people are really excited um, about this work. Um, the board president spoke favorably about it. Um, commissioners that were sort of new, newer to the concept spoke favorably about it. Um, Angie Kraft, the Surface Water and Sewers Director, joined uh, Michael Schroeder and I for the presentation. So we had a good showing, and um, we're kind of taking the show on the road from there. Next week, we'll be at the Climate and Infrastructure Committee meeting for the city, which is on the 29th at 1.30. And then um, after that, it'll have made its way out of committee, and we'll be at the March 20th Park Board meeting and the March 21st City Council meeting. Um, the proposal on our end is to bring this straight to the board because I feel like we've discussed it so many different times, so many different ways. On March 28th, we plan to have Michael Schroeder and Angie Kraft join us. If you'd like to have that show up in committee beforehand to kick the tires one more time and talk to the liaisons and get another briefing, we can certainly do that. But I talked to Mike and our recommendation would be based on the number of uh, looks that we've already had that we could bring it on March 28th. But that's the process that we're going through with the park board in the city right now. Good. Wonderful. Preferences on that as a group? Would you like to see that in committee and discuss it, committee. it or bring the formal yeah. partnership forward on the 28th? Yep, yeah, bring it forward. Okay. Okay. Bring it forward. And then in uh, the kind of north central part of the watershed, having some partnership engagement for the Long Lake Creek Roadmap. So um, Becky's been reaching out to the City of Long Lake, City of Medina, Long Lake Waters, and Orono. We're going to start with Orono. Um, she's got me on deck, I think, to present March 11th at City Council. We're going to be seeking a resolution of support from Orono City Council. We already had a meeting with city staff over there for the County Road 6 uh, pond retrofit. So um, we're starting to make some connections out there in front of council, and we'll keep folks informed as to how that goes too. That's what I have for this evening's administrator's report. A little bit, felt a little bit more polished on my end than committee, so hopefully that's how you received it. And if there aren't any questions, we can move to our final final item. Okay. No questions? Yep, no questions. Well, um, I think everybody knows, um, but we're gonna welcome uh, Tiffany Schaffler up to the dais and she had sent an email out to the board announcing her departure from the organization and we wanna give her some space to say her, her goodbyes <coughs> and farewells to the board. All right, good evening, President White Board of Managers. As James said, I'm here tonight to say goodbye and thank you. happening much sooner than anticipated. All right. I'll, I'll insert some laughter here. So when I started the district 13 years ago, I was a young 26 year old, which might seem old to some of the staff here tonight, but I was ecstatic that I'd finally, yeah. <laughs> 
I had finally, I had finally made it, landed my my first real job, as you recall. Uh, in 2010, it was a little bit different time. Finding a full-time job was a little bit harder um, coming out of the recession. And I came to the district with skills really in vegetation management and restoration. Knew nothing about water management, operating a dam. And 13, 13 years later, I've gained just a ton of invaluable experiencing managing what we know are some of the state's most iconic resources. And I'll forever be grateful for the, the rich opportunities that I've been given and trusted to lead here. And I just want to tick off a few of kind of my, my proudest moments in the 13 years here. Um, one was, I think, just a couple years in being thrown the, the design and implementing the Six Mile Marsh Prairie Restoration out in Six Mile. Um, leading the district through the chaos, chaos of what was the record flooding in 2014. Out of that flooding, creating the partnership to improve how we operate the dam and flood, flood forecasting, and then also elevating our communications around that. Um, serving on the district's leadership team with James, developing the vision and match plan for the Minneapolis Creek Corridor, Minneapolis, which is, is fun to hear now. You're um, stealing all my <laughs> Like actively okay. to rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh, Co-authoring the Lake Nakamas area groundwater and surface evaluation, and then lastly, being trusted to lead and sustain the district's culture. And that last one means a lot to me because I recognize the rare opportunity I've had to lean into my strengths of connecting and relationship building. And I deeply care for the people that I've had the privilege to cross paths with pass with here while working here, and I will forever be grateful for the lifelong friendships and connections. While I'm extremely proud of the work that I've accomplished at the district, it was only possible because of the people that are sitting, sitting in front of me and behind me and those that have sat beside me over the years. I want to take some time today to thank the board of managers for your dedication, vision, and bold leadership. So I'll start with manager Hejmadi. We first met in 2018 at the Nakomas Community Center when you attended the CAC meeting for the, I think it was the first Parkway Blissful Master Plan. And I appreciated your enthusiasm then and at that meeting and, the appreci and that appreciation has grown with any, every interaction that we've had. And I'm grateful for the, the human element you've brought to the board and the district and your thoughtful questions of staff to ensure everything we do is the best it can be. Manager Maxwell, I first got to know you as Mayor Maxwell. I've appreciated the municipal perspective you've brought and your ability to see things from many angles. I'm grateful for your questions that always positively stress test staff's approach and your championing staff's work. Manager Olson, our tenure aligns almost goals closely. I think you started right after I did. And I've always appreciated your ability to jump into the details while also being able to zoom out to see the big vision. I'm grateful for all, the, all your time and effort to gain support for the district's work in the upper watershed and your care of, for staff along the way. And President White, I've had the pleasure of joining you in a variety of experiences, from sitting down at the Capitol together to observe Rep Representative Oginius's Climate Committee, to meeting with state legislators to educate them on our district, the district's work, and randomly bumping into each other at the Six Mile Marsh Prairie Restoration. I'm grateful for your calm and consistent leadership, which has been critical during the messy times and encouraging during the easy times. And Manager Sando, we first met in 2012, if you remember, you were eager to remove Buckthorn from Arden Park. <laughs> I've appreciated your endless eagerness and passion to improve that important, the important natural resources in the watershed. And I'm grateful for your positive support of staff and the work that we do day in and day out. And I know Manager Loftus and Manager Miller aren't here, but I want to note that uh, Manager Loftus, I first got to know her during her leadership and management at the city of Orno, Orno. And along the way, I've appreciated her strategic thinking and drive for continuous improvement. I'm grateful for her ability to see the big picture and make the hard decisions while also being an advocate for staff. And lastly, Manager Miller, I want to acknowledge him and say that I've appreciated his ability to create a bold vision and help staff figure out along the way. I'm grateful for his quiet compliments to staff, and I'll always remember his comment that if James is the brain of this place, then I'm the heart. Uh -huh. 
Speaking of the brains, I mean James. <laughs> I first met James when he interv interviewed me in 2008 for a permanent intern position. Thankfully, he made a smart decision and hired me. <laughs> and the rest is history. Joking aside, James's leadership and support over my 13 years here have pushed me into arenas I never contemplated to take on myself. And that's because James has an ability to see the potential in people before they do. It's no secret that James's dedication to making this place the best it can be is evident, is evident in everything he does. I'm grateful to have been a witness to that dedication and his strive for excellence. But what I'm most grateful for about James is the 15 years of friendship, experiences, and laughs we had along the way, and our shared love of bourbon and Tina Turner's music. <laughs> Next, I want to thank. <laughs> now that's out there in the in the record. Oh, dear. I think everybody knew. <laughs> I also want to take a moment to thank Becky and Michael. I know Becky's not here, but Michael is. Along with James, we've been on a wild ride um, during our time at the district, and I'm thankful to have had the opportunity to work alongside both of them and learn from their integrity and drive towards what's right and needs to be done. And I'll forever be grateful for their friendship and unwavering support over the years. And lastly, I want to thank Josh. He entered the Project Maintenance and Land Management program a little over a year ago with an open mind and heart, and he's been a true joy to work with. So I want to end by thanking the board and staff for your leadership, integrity, and support. It's meant so much to me, and it's truly been a privilege to serve and work alongside you. And I want to end by saying that eventually everyone in this room will join the ranks as an MCWD alumni. And when you do, I'll welcome you with the open arms just as the current alumni group has reached out to me. So now, the last question I have is, who do I give these damn keys to? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just a few thank tears. You. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Sherry is like giving me the Sherry Davis <laughs> wink and nod, but there's no way to follow that. Um, I mean, that you pretty much said everything and said it so poetically and from the heart. There's, you know, I'll just be retreading old ground, and I've exchanged a lot of my words offline with with Tiffany and you understand how I feel and my gratitude for everything that you've done for the organization and my love for you and um, we'll keep talking but there's, yeah there's just not really words to put um, to some experiences so I'll just kind of say the same things that you said <laughs> I, I mean I just have the most I want to express my most heartfelt gratitude um, individually but on behalf I think of the board and the, the staff for everything that Tiffany's done in 13 years. And when you zoom out, it's really impressive what she's accomplished. And she listed it all um, for the organization and our mission, for the team, I think for our partners, for me. Um, and she mentioned, you know, after first joining as a permanent, it was an interesting time. We had a joint powers agreement that gave us some limited time grant funding to do inspections on behalf of the Pollution Control Agency. And that's how Tiffany came in. And I think you might have left for a season after the grant dried up and it, it miraculously came back to us and moved into maintenance and planning and some very co-mingling of that over the years and helped us deliver the... 101 Causeway, which was a project mm -hmm. and a half. So every time you drive, anybody drives <laughs> between Wayside and, and Grays Bay, you can think about Tiffany's work there on rebuilding that causeway and delivering that in a way that was really ecologically friendly. I think, of course, the work on the dam, um, 
doesn't need any introduction. That you could talk about that. I think we have for hours. We've given presentations on it. It's been the, the focus of climate conferences, um, flood briefings for all of our communities, but the communications on high water level and how our communities have really uh, responded so favorably to that consistent level of communication, the amount of trust that it's built, trust in Tiffany, and it's cascaded into trust in the organization, the partnership that she went out and just pioneered with the National Weather Service and Hennepin County and the USGS, and then, of course, we just had that insane flood of record in 2014, right when we needed it. Um, and we pivoted from that event, or you did, you pivoted from that event and chased down a bunch of FEMA money that we have to close out before you leave <laughs> next week. Um, the auditors told me so. Um, and from there into de delivering the uh, Minnehaha Creek Regional Master Plan. And it's so cool, all the connections that you mentioned and the connection that you um, made there with, with Arun. But it's just wild to think that that's the basis of what we're implementing now. When we talk about bringing this partnership back in March, like how long it takes for our work but that really started in the flooding, and the trust that we had, the partnership that we built, you built with the park board. And that master plan is now, like, we're gonna be delivering what you vision. And then you mentioned, of course, the, that, the odyssey, I don't know how <laughs> you could describe it any other way, but the odyssey of bringing science to community with and the Nokomis surface and groundwater, which was just a tremendous amount of work and struggle and difficulty. And we were kind of shoulder to shoulder in that for, it felt like about five, five and a half years right to the finish. And I think as Tiffany mentioned in her own words, those connector strength, I think beyond all the work, um, a defining trait of your time in the organization has been just her character and the contribution to people. and. That stuff, as we, we talked about in the strategic action plan, that's one of our five areas, investing in people and culture and growing the culture of excellence. It's invisible. Um, it doesn't show up in a concrete project or a discrete initiative. Um, it's people leaning in and living our values day to day and providing that example. And Tiffany's done that from the beginning, showing just tremendous character of leadership, helping set our culture from the beginning. Um, Living those values when it's really hard is, is what makes culture, and she's done that over and over again. Um, I think there's been a number of people, and you mentioned our alumni, that have been on the receiving end of, of Tiffany kneeling down and picking people up when they're struggling, and um, being a safety net for people when they're really going through tough times. And that's not stopped inside the organization. I think you've built tremendous trusting relationships with all of our community partners, um, our cities, but then residents. Um, and then some of those people that you've connected with um, found their way onto the board. So it's like the, the Tiffany connections run wide and deep, and she shows just a, an undying care for people. Um, and that's been a defining trait, I think, in how she's approached work and the real value that she's delivered to the organization beyond the projects. I mean, in a nutshell, um, Minnehaha Creek's just a much better place having had the great fortune um, of crossing paths with, with Tiffany. And so on behalf of the district, I would just express my, my deepest appreciation and love and gratitude um, for everything that you've done for us and for the team and for me and um, yeah, for building that lasting friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's not awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open it up for board members. There's not much to say, Tiffany. You've been, you've been a great, great person. You're a great person. Just, just go with that. You, you can accomplish so much stuff, anything that you want to do. So go for it. Do what you do best. Thank you. I'd just like to mention that you're a true lady. That's a compliment. A true lady. <laughs> I um, will always value the, the imprint you've left here, what the projects that, you, that have all been talked about, and your effect on people inside and outside the building. Um, and I'm really glad for you that you get this chance to um, reflect and reset. We'll miss you. Thank you.
You're the, I agree with your comment about being the heart of the watershed. Yeah. There are so many people that uh, um, see us as you, mm. and uh, there couldn't be a better person to to uh, want to be a part of that reflection. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you all, always operate from the heart. <coughs> always from the heart. That's where you come from first. And that has affected the staff. But that is also what, you know, like um, Bill was saying, you represent sort of the face. You always have that warm, empathic, receptive, uh, quality to to the people that you've to the community that you worked with and have really helped uh, have helped the district establish credibility because you know you can do things but it's when you connect with people at the heart that's when it really makes a difference that's where it really lives because once you come connect at the heart if you make a couple of mistakes people will forgive you they'll you know, it's not a big deal if they know you're connected with them right here. And that's that's what I've seen you do consistently over time. And so I hope that you follow your heart for yourself now <laughs> as you move forward and take the time you need to digest whatever you need to and make the right step again following your heart. Thank you. And I wish you well on that. Thank you so much. <coughs> All right. Finishing the meeting yeah. in tears. <laughs> uh, we cried at a lot of board meetings. Yeah. But this is uh yeah, it's quite a way to to, to end. I thank you, Tiffany, for everything yeah. you've done. Thank you. And All we right. were planning um pretty good staff party and we'll be expressing our appreciation once again there so thank you for that right. thank you um, there just one little business item I'll mention that manager Olson pointed out that March um, 14th is the next board meeting not March 11th and with that we're adjourned okay.